Okay, good morning, and welcome back. All right, so let's get to business. Tomorrow night, exam two. I hope that's not a shocker to anyone. If it is, I'm sorry. Okay, and also, so tomorrow exam two is 6.30 to 7.30 um, p.m. The location is posted on the course web page. I also got it on the other screen here in the room. Just like last time, it depends on where, who your instructor is. Um, so make sure you look that up. Look at the course calendar. Pay attention to what's going on Friday. We do have class on Friday. Even though we, we are supposed to give you a day off after each exam, we will have class this Friday. And same thing with the Friday after exam three. So therefore, we're going to owe you two days. So we're going to pay you back the week of Thanksgiving break, Monday and Tuesday. All right? That's the first time anyone has ever clapped for anything I've said. That, that's nice, thanks. Okay, so we, the two days we're going to save until Thanksgiving break. All right. Okay, let's get to the review then. Um, first of all, I got a few questions about what formulas you will be given. Um, any formula from the table for integrating with table will be given to you, anything that's needed. So what's going to happen is if, we ha if you get a question on integrating something with a, with a formula from the table, we'll give you a formula and you have to figure out what U is, what A is, and then make it work. Look at the exam from last semester. It'll be formulated very, very similar to that one. Look at the, the, uh, the one on integrating with a formula. Um, we will give you midpoint rule, midpoint rule, trapezoidal rule, and Simpson's rule formulas if you need them. If the problem requires you to use one of those things, it will be provided to you. And I don't want to make a big, long formula sheet to, to clutter everything up. So everything, anything you need inside a problem, a formula will be given to you. And other things like integ the integral of secant, secant cubed, that kind of things, they will be provided to you if needed. Okay? Okay, so let's start. Where does it start? It starts with integ integration by parts. Right, integration by parts requires us to identify one part of the integral as u and the other part as dv. <coughs> Once we have that, then we simply do uv minus the integral of v du. And remember the order to choose u Start with logarithmic, inverse trig, algebraic trig, and finally exponential. <coughs> Let's look at a couple quick examples. So how do you know when to use integration by parts? One clue is when you're looking at this integral, when you have mixed kind of stuff, right? We got algebraic and trig. That's a pretty good indication that we need to use integration by parts. You, there's some problems that you may be able to get away with integration by substitution, but of usually when you see this kind of mixture of, of different types of things, it's not a bad indication that integration by parts should be considered. Here, x is the algebraic part, and this, of course, is a trig part. Right? So, According to the, the rule of thumb we have, we will want to choose algebraic before trig. So we're going to let u be x and dv be cosine of 2x. 
you differentiate u, and then you integrate dv. All right, so integral of cosine of 2x is 1 half sine of 2x. And then according to the formula, we have uv minus v du. We get um, 1 half x sine 2x minus the integral of 1 half sine 2x and dx. The last integral that you have to do very often is related to the integral you did from going from dv to v. Very often, not always, but should be, very often is, is similar. So integrating sine of 2x, that's just like integrating cosine. It's a very similar type of integral. And here, we're going to get minus 1 half. What's the integral of sine of 2x? Negative, that's right, negative one-half cosine 2x, right? Because the derivative of um, cosine is negative sine, so this ends up being this thing, plus 1 over 4 cosine 2x plus c. Okay, so that's a very typical example of integration by parts. Let's look at another one here. We're not going to integrate all the way, but so here I got x cubed and natural log of x. And according to the rule of thumb, we have a good choice of u is natural log of x and dv is x cubed. Now, one, one, one red flag when you're trying to do this that is trying to tell you that you're doing something wrong is suppose we flip these two around. Suppose you made a wrong choice. One of these will end up being rather difficult to do, usually dv. Right? We can differentiate things pretty easily, but this, that's not an easy one to do. In fact, to integrate this, this is another integration by parts to integrate natural log of x. So this is a pretty good indication that you've made a wrong choice. Okay, so that's on integration by parts. I think most people are pretty comfortable with that. So. Let's move on to the more challenging stuff, um, trig integrals. And we, like, we look at two different kinds of these things. We look at cosine to some, sine to some power times cosine to some potentially other power, uh, and same thing with secant and tangent. And in the book and also in class, I gave you some rules to follow on what happens when sine, when n is odd, m is even, stuff like that. Basically, what you, all you gotta remember is you gotta make a substitution of some sort and there are two choices each time. You want to make the substitution that works. So for example, if you can memorize the rules like what to do when, when one of them is even, one of them is odd, that's great. But suppose you forgot a rule, just remember you're making a substitution. And you have two choices. 
The first choice is u is equal to sine of x. The second choice is u is equal to cosine of x. And you'll find out that one of these usually doesn't work out, right? For example, if u is equal to sine and du is cosine, then this thing turns into that's a power of three. That's a three there. All right, so that's u. And this is du. And then you got this cosine cube here that you need to somehow relate to u. Well, in this case, it's not easy to do. If this were cosine squared, then we know what to do. If this were cosine fourth, we know what to do. But an odd power is a problem. So that's an indication that that's not a good choice. Try the other one. You only have two choices to make. And you'll see the other choice works out perfectly. If u is cosine and then du is minus sine, then that, let me rearrange things a little bit. And this is perfect. You see, this turns into u to the fourth, and this is negative du. So we get integral of u, to negative integral u to the fourth du. And it becomes trivial from that point on. So that's the, how, that's the way I actually handle these things. I don't like memorizing rules. I, I know I have two choices to make. I try one out. If it doesn't work, I try the other one. And it does, really doesn't take too much time to, to inspect this kind of situation. Um, sine squared or cosine to the fifth. Again, two choices, u is equal to sine or, d or u is equal to cosine. And try one out, if it works, Great. If it doesn't, try the other U, right? You only have two U's to make, 50-50. So let's see. Let's try, hmm. and we'll see what happens. Let's try U is equal to sign. I need a DU. I need a cosine in DU, so I'm going to borrow one from cosine to the fifth. So now this is equal to u squared. This is du, right? <coughs> Cosine to the fourth. Is cosine squared squared.
and you're trying to relay what you got here to you, which is sine. And when you have squared, that's perfect. We know the Pythagorean identity to do that. One minus sine squared. Right? So this is then one minus u squared squared. Okay, so that's a good, that's a success here in terms of substitution you made because you got an integral in terms of u and that's not very difficult to do. <coughs> Multiply this out. Multiply this in and integrate term by term. So I'm going to skip the integration there but want to focus on the, the substitutions that we have to make. Right? Questions? Yeah. Negative, you don't have to worry about that. Right? That, that <coughs> if we give a problem that you have to arrange a little bit, eventually you'll end up with sine to a positive power, cosine to a positive power, or secant to a positive power, tangent to a positive power. If one of them is negative, then this method here is not appropriate. If one of them is negative, then maybe a substitution is what you want to consider. Okay. And uh, you're not going to see that. Okay. Let's look at one with a secant and tangent. Uh, try this one. Secant cubed and tangent to the first. Once again, you got two choices to consider. I can let u be secant or I can let u be tangent. If u is secant, then du is secant tangent. If u is tangent, then du is secant squared. Again, let me show you what happens when the wrong choice is made. Something is always left over that you can't do anything about. I need secant squared in du, so I'm going to borrow one, a two of them from there. <coughs> this is u, right? This is du. And this, we can't do anything about. I can't turn into turn a secant into a tangent simply uh, without messing things up too much so you're going to look at the leftover part the, the, the things we have to relate one to another is the Pythagorean identity I want things to be squared. If it's squared, then I can relate them. But it's not squared. If it's to the fourth power, then it's just square squared. I can still relate them. So this is not going to work. The other choice is what we want to try then. If u is secant, 
then du is secant tangent. So I need a secant tangent. Therefore, I need to borrow one from here. <coughs> so then we have u squared du. And then that becomes trivial to do. OK, so the, all it comes down to is the power of what's left over there. Can you deal with that using one of these two identities? If you can, then that's great. But if you, you, know, if you forget how to do it, make two choices, try them both out, one of them should work out relatively easily. OK, on the exam, it'll be an easy integral. We're not going to give you anything too, too outrageous to do. We're not going to give you anything outrageous to do. Let me take away the qualifier there. OK, so that's trick. Oh, one more thing. How would you handle this one? Half angle, right? So what's the, what does cosine squared turn into? Good, 1 plus cosine 2x over 2. And if it's 2 to the fourth, then it's the same idea. Right, then you get this thing squared, multiply it out, integrate term by term, <coughs> and it wouldn't be too difficult. So here are the formulas that are relevant. Cosine is plus, sine is minus. Just think about when cosine, when x is 0, cosine should give you a 1. So 1 plus 1 divided by 2 gives you a 1. And then when sine is 0, you get a 0. 1 minus 1, nothing. Question? Should I have? Yes, it should be. Thanks. Same thing there? OK, thanks. OK, so that's trig substitution. I think so. I don't remember. I wrote this more than a week ago. If not, it's not too much to ask to, to remember. So I'll try to remember these. So remember these two. And if they're a given, great. If not, then you'll be fine. I think we gave it to you. I don't remember. All right. Now let's talk about trig substitution. This is the more... These things get more and more challenging, of course. <coughs> Almost always you see a square root somewhere in your integration here. So like this one here, square root of 9 minus x squared. So that's probably a trick substitution thing. Right, there's no other way to integrate that. We can't use a substitution. That's not going to give us, get us anywhere. Integration by parts, this is not going to give us, get us anywhere either. So you've run out of your methods to a trick substitution. To do that, we want to build a triangle with these sides. <coughs> the, first, the first side, well, one of the sides is the, is the radical expression. The next side is the constant, 
uh, with a power of one half. So square root of nine is three, and then square root of x squared, and that's an x. And the order you want to put these sides down, you always start with the hypotenuse and then the adjacent. The last side is automatically taken care of once you've got these two nailed down. If the expression under radical is a difference, then you look at the first term and that is going to be related to the hypotenuse. So therefore, radical 9 or 3. So this is the square root of um, first term. If it's a difference under radical. If this were x squared minus 9, then hypotenuse would get x, okay? Okay, so 3 goes to the adjacent. Uh, I'm sorry, hypotenuse. Then adjacent, you got two more here. You got one that contains a constant, one, one doesn't. Let's put the one that contains a constant down as the adjacent. Therefore, x has to go to the last side, which is the opposite. Okay? Okay, next then we make it re relate x to theta. We can relate x to theta in a bunch of different ways. Always choose the one that's the simplest way possible. So relate the two simplest sides, in other words. We want to relate this using the opposite and the hypotenuse. Now you get the, the uh, substitution you want to make. X is equal to 3 sine theta. That takes care of the x. We've got to take care of the, uh, co uh, the uh, dx. And you can see 9 minus x squared is 9 minus 9 sine squared. And that gives you 3 cosine. Okay. Now this becomes this integral. Radical 9 minus x squared, we said, turn into 3 cosine. dx turns into 3 cosine also. So we get 9 cosine squared. Nine over two, one plus cosine. 2 theta.
And let's integrate this one all the way through because we need to make a reverse substitution later. One integrates into uh, theta, and then cosine two theta is one half sine two theta. So I'm bringing my triangle back because we need to reverse the substitution. Do you remember what to do with this sine of 2 theta? Right, because we don't have a triangle of 2 theta, we won't be able to get this from that triangle. So we have to make a substitution, 2 sine cosine. And once, once again, I don't remember if we're going to give you that formula or not. Um, assume not and be surprised pleasantly if we do. I don't even know if you're going to need it. I, I don't know. Okay, from earlier we saw that um, sine of theta is x over 3. So that takes care of this. From the same triangle, I see cosine is adjacent over the hypotenuse. So that takes care of cosine. I can take care of theta in a multiple of ways, right? different ways to do that. I can even do a tangent if I really want to. But generally, when I want to choose the simplest way to do it, which is our sign here. So there we go. Okay, theta, I use this here to get my inverse sine of x over 3. Sine is that, cosine is that, and my constant. Questions? All right, partial fraction next. So this is all about making the stuff you're trying to integrate easier to do. And the clue you usually get is this kind of thing downstairs that, that looks like you can factor. That's, that's a very good clue that partial fractions is the way to do it. All right, so this is going to be 3x plus 5 over... x um, minus 4, minus 2, right? Yeah. 
Okay, then we're going to break this up. We have two distinct linear factors. That was the simplest case we looked at. So right-hand side is the first, either one. You can start with either one. I'd like to start with the, the first one I see. So that's a linear. We put a constant over the top. There. And then the second linear factor, we put a B over that. And then we have to find the constants a and b, and then go back to the simpler integral, and then integrate it through. All right, so let's see what do we get. We're going to multiply by that on both sides. Left, has, left side is 3x plus 5. Right side is a times x minus 2 plus b, x minus 4. Simplify. Not really simplify, but collecting things. Okay, left-hand side is 3x plus 5. Right-hand side is a plus bx plus stuff. You match them up. These must be equal, and these two must be equal. So we get, what is it, a plus b is equal to 3, and then minus 2a, um, minus 4b is equal to 5. And I know on the homework you, you have a few of these that were rather tricky to do. We're not going to give you anything too difficult to do. It'll be probably something like that, maybe a little bit harder than that, but nothing as hard as some of the more difficult ones you saw on the homework that took quite a while to do. Okay, so don't worry too much about what you have to solve. It'll be reasonable. So one way to do it is to do a substitution Um, what do we see? We see uh, 2a is equal to 17. a is 17 over 2. b is 3 minus a, and whatever that is, minus 11 over 2. Okay, now you got a and b, you go back to integrate these. That turns into a bunch of natural logs, right? So a pretty simple integral from that point on. Okay, let's quickly review the other cases. So you have to integrate that, but that's a step that um, we can skip here. This time we have a linear and an irreducible quadratic. The 
linear part is easy, a over x plus 1. And what do you put over the, the irreducible quadratic? Right, a linear term, exactly. So when they are not repeated, the stuff on the top is always one degree lower than the denominator. And then you will solve the constants exactly the same way. When they're repeated, though, that rule gets broken. <coughs> so here we have a repeat of x minus 1. First, you take care of that the usual way, a over x minus 1, one degree lower than the denominator. Then the repeat part, right, so this technically has a second degree, but we put a constant over that because it is repeated. It breaks that rule when it's repeated. And then finally, the, the other linear part that's not repeated, it just gets a basic constant So we're going to give you a, uh, one or two of these problems where you have to break things down. <coughs> two problems, I think, if I remember right. So I'm not going to talk about the table and the trapezoidal rule stuff because we'll give you the formulas. You just got to plug the right stuff into the right place. It'll be easy. It's practically a, a gi giveaway, which is okay. I don't mind those things. Okay, in proper integrals, remember we look at two types of these. First one is when you have infinity in one of the integration bounds. <coughs> Something like that, for example. So you yank out the, the infinity, putting a symbol a, and then take the limit, allowing a to go to infinity or negative infinity, whichever one it, uh, it is. And then you integrate this as usual. e to the minus x turns into negative e to the minus x. So we get negative e to the minus a. Let me write that as 1 over e to the a minus minus e to the 0. That's a 1. <coughs> now when a becomes large, e to the large number is very large number. 1 over that goes to 0. That first part goes to zero, and then we have a one that doesn't care what A is doing. <coughs> the 
second one is when this function you're integrating is discontinuous at either left, right bound, or somewhere in between. So at zero, this thing's got a problem. Therefore, we cannot go to start at zero. And P is just some constant here. Okay, so you yank away the, the, the problematic bound, which is zero here, and let it be A. And then we approach A, but this, in this case here, actually, we're implying that we're approaching zero from the right-hand side, right? We're going to start with, with something that's very close to zero, but not quite there, and then try to push the bound to it. Then you integrate this the usual way to come up with the integral. Don't forget the uh, terminology. If you say the integral converges or conver is convergent, that means the answer is not plus or minus infinity. The integral is divergent. That means the answer is either plus or minus infinity or it doesn't exist. Okay, two more things. Oh, there's a lot of stuff on this exam. Arc length. Now this one, we're not going to give it to you. And I showed you in class how, how you can get these things by just adding up a bunch of little short segments. So if you forget, think about where these came from and then reconstruct them as needed. For any curve, provided that these things exist, there are always two ways to calculate arc length. So when we give you a, a function to calculate, think about which one is more, more easy to handle. For surface area, this formula will give to you if you need it. But basically, it's 2 pi <coughs> times the radius times the arc length. Okay, that's the fundamental form, and they're actually because there are two ways to calculate the, the arc length, there are multiple ways to calculate this for either going about the x or the y axis. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much it. All right, tomorrow in recitation, your, there's another review. Your, an, your TA will answer more questions. And exam is tomorrow night, okay? See you tomorrow.